Hi, everyone. I'm Linda Van Hart, the Visual Arts Coordinator for Common Ground on the Hill. Welcome to the Gallery Talks for week two. Tonight, you have the great pleasure to see a wide variety of two-dimensional artists. We'll be talking with Janet Kozacek, Lee Newman, Susan Massif, Bill Grout, and Sue Bloom. So you get a variety from drawing to photography with a little stop and watercolor monoprints. One of the issues we've been dealing with is sheltering within, sheltering at home. And the difference between that idea and the idea of migrating within, migrating home. The shelter within, we've all had to deal with that in the last couple of months. It's a protective measure to find some place you call home and be safe there. Migrating, on the other hand, usually involves much more action than just retreat. Migrating often means going from one place to another. And as artists, many of us have taken advantage of this gift of time by this terrible disease. And we have migrated within and found new territory, uh, not just because of the change of season, which often triggers a migration, uh, not just because we wanted to change employment because many of us have not been able to work uh, outside our homes, but as artists, we are much more than sheltering within. We have migrated within and we found new territory. Some of the artists tonight may speak to those issues. We will all be dealing with the action of creativity, how imagination and forces beyond our control can often trigger the sort of fulminating chaos that a breeds brand new art. We're going to look at the work of Janet Kozacek. We're honoring Janet this year as our Visual Arts Award recipient, and that award ceremony will take place during Friday night ceremony. So you'll get to see more of Janet and her work after tonight if you join us at that Friday night ceremony. Janet is one of the few people I know that is fluent in Chinese. She can actually read the signature seals on 16th century Chinese paintings. She's, it's quite marvelous, quite a marvelous skill. She's very talented in other aspects of creativity, but she's gonna share her two-dimensional skills with you tonight. Janet Kozacek. Hi, uh, good evening. Um, well, I'm um, not someone who likes to be recorded too much, but we'll do, I'll do my best. Um, yeah, I've been sheltering in place for a long time now. Um, I've been working on a uh, protracted project, a, a book called You Look Great, uh, Making Invisible Disease Visible. And uh, it started out as a catalog because I made so many drawings about um, uh, slow recovery from a rather devastating uh, illness. Um, so I think probably the best thing to do is just go um, uh, explain some of the iconography in my drawings. And then that way, uh, uh, I think, probably better understand the text. Um, so is there um, a way to stream the drawings? I, is that what we're- Just one moment. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay. Certainly more comfortable with that. It's quite a nice build up. Thank you. Oh, okay. So. We'll look at the first one. Ah, yes. This one is called the Somatizer Witchcraft Trial. Um, as many women experience uh, when trying to uh, obtain medical treatment, especially if they have complicated illnesses, is that so often their, Ill, uh, their symptoms are dismissed and, and uh, seen as emotional or 
uh, psychosomatic. And that actually is one of the reasons for diagnostic delays. And this one, this particular drawing, um, it discusses and explores the idea of, of mislabeling in that, uh, in that respect. Um, the, the title comes from uh, a quote from Dr. Thomas Sass, and I'll, I'll read you that quote. In the days of the malleus, if the physician could find no evidence of natural illness, he was expected to find evidence of witchcraft. Today, if he cannot diagnose organic illness, he is expected to diagnose mental illness. Now, the, the malleus that uh, Dr. Thomas says refers to here is the malleus maleficarum, um, which also is loosely translated as Hammer the Witches. It was uh, a 16th century treatise by the friar Heinrich Kramer and was used during the Inquisition to ferret out um, uh, witches uh, for punishment and extermination. Um, now, the overlay here with that is the modern day um, uh, punishments, if you will, uh, due to these, these mislabelings. And here you see three First of all, at the top, you see all the uh, accusatory fingers. And then in the, the middle ground, you see the, um, the figures that are turned one way and then the other. And there are three of them. And I, I use the um, number three a lot in, in my work uh, because it has very ancient roots uh, going all the way back to uh, the Greek uh, choruses where you have an ode that is uh, split into three with a strophe, an anastrophe, and an, an epode. And in fact, they, these parallel, the figures parallel that, that, that kind of tragic chorus where you have uh, the first, the strophe, uh, they, the uh, figures are going left and then uh, uh, for the anastrophe, right? Now, um, these labels on them uh, were inspired also by um, an experience I had in China where I, I witnessed three criminals that were being taken to a public square for execution. And when they were on their way to, to uh, their execution, I, I noticed that they had these black placards put hung over them and they had their names crossed out and a label uh, for their crime underneath. And um, so in, in parallel, I have these women with names crossed out and instead uh, uh, a, a kind of invective symptom uh, like hypochondriac, uh, la belle indifference and, and somatizer. And if we look town, we see that it's, um, it's a little hard to see, but there's a little um, phrase here that people may have heard uh, when trying to find out uh, from a healthcare pro uh, professional what, what might be wrong with them. And it's, it, it's all just stress. <laughs> it's the, kind of the, the um, fallback diagnosis when faced with a mystery. Okay, we can, um, I, I, as you know, I, I also write poetry. Um, whoops. <laughs> can we go back to the other one for a moment? Okay, yes, I, there, there is a little poem that goes with this and it, it parallels um, the, the Thomas Sass. And uh, it's, I write, um, verse that's very serious, but I also do um, things that I would call lyric poetry that's uh, kind of snarky rhymes. So here's the little poem for this one, for the psychosomatic witchcraft trial. We have determined by how our judgment sits that you are guilty of being a somatizer witch. 
you have hexed your body to believe in its pain by the poisonous spells from your wicked brain. You claim that an allergy caused your rash. Confess that it's witchcraft or you'll get the lash. You say that you hurt from a swollen aorta. We know that it's goblin conversion disorder. You have no proof that you have migraine. You are a hypervigilant succubus, it's very plain. There is no such thing as collagen defects, only spells at a hypochondriasis hex. You are sentenced to mental retraining's devotional to learn that your pain is only emotional. Believe in your guilt and you will get well. Deny it and your body will burn in hell. And there we have that. Okay, we could go on to the next. This one was rather grim. All right, Th this one is a redo of an old drawing I made uh, a number of years ago of a postage stamp. And um, it's a Taiwanese stamp. And it was only several years later after I actually did go to China and, and learn Chinese painting that I found the um, painter depicted in here is, is Long Shiming, which is actually uh, um, uh, Giuseppe Castiglione. So he was also a foreigner who had gone to China and learned how to do uh, Chinese painting on silk. Okay, we could go on. This is also about, um, also deals with, with illness again, and, and it's about uh, um, vestiges of old archaic ideas that are, are, are still among us. Um, so that's why it's called phrenological overlay. Uh, there are a lot of details in here. Uh, I developed a very minute a uh, picky kind of style because um, for a long time I wasn't uh, able to um, use my body the way I, I, I was able to previously. So I was stuck in one place for a while. So that's why I ended up getting very much involved in details. This one, the overlay here is um, uh, with Galen's four humors, yellow bile and black phlegm and blood, and um, along with uh, contemporary questionable um, diagnoses. Um, some of the e even um, uh, contemptuous names that uh, uh, some frustrated practitioners use like heart sink patients and uh, other things like that, MUSP. Um, if you look at the border, there is a certain irony here too. It, it represents um, a spontaneous generation, uh, which of course is also a, a, a debunked theory from, from ages ago. And if you look closely though at the um, border design, you'll see that there it's not just a, a, a um, a design with non-objective elements. They're, they're actually flies that go head to head and there's a little maggot in the, in the top. Uh, okay, we could go next. I don't want to take up too much time. <laughs> so I, also my wee brain sampler, uh, again, it's, a, it's an ironic piece. These are dendrites along the border. Um, it's an MRI of a brain. And uh, over the course of my writing, I ended up doing a lot of research on um, some of the things that would uh, prevent and delay um, diagnosis and, and getting patients help. Um, some of, and most of them were, are quite innocent. It's just a, a, an ingrained bias and, uh, and it's just the way people are trained. One interesting a uh, cognitive error that you often see is called expertise um, bias and, uh, and, and an expertise blindness. Um, there was an experiment done with uh, radiologists uh, some time ago where a, a little gorilla was put on an x-ray and, and, but the radiologists were told to look for something else, some kind of tumor. And so they were so intent on finding what they were told to look for that they 
most of them, I think 80% didn't see the gorilla. And so in this so-called you know, MRI, I, I'm putting all these strange things into it, like a, you know, a, a, a seahorse, <laughs> little butterfly wings. The seahorse though, ironically, is um, uh, named for a brain part, the hippocampus, it's named after a seahorse. And of course, then the whole thing is like a, an embroidery, my, my wee brain. We could go on. Oh, this is called uh, Signs of the Feet. And these are, this one makes use of a lot of um, a ch ancient Chinese language. This one, the footprint, has prints inside it. So it's a, a print within a print. And uh, this particular, this piece here says uh, eternal joy. And this one is health, but it's printed upside down. And this one is um, a breath of life, qi yun. Um, seal script is a very ancient form of Chinese writing. And uh, it was, was uh, at one point um, used by shamans. And in fact, the, there was a belief that it had like apotropaic powers. You could ward things off with this language, or you could also um, make things happen simply by writing. And uh, there is one story I was reading that was quite interesting where um, the stone seal was used in, um, placed in, into wild animal footprints. And the the message on the on the seal would say keep going forward, and so people would press it into like predators, like tiger prints, and and when the print was still fresh, and that would of course inspire the tiger tiger to keep going forward and not double back and and, and eat people. Okay, we can go on. That might be it. Oh, this one. Now most of the. The uh, drawings that I have here have to do with health, and that was my focus for many years. Um, but this this one is a little more lighthearted. It is a um, called parrot in in uh, translation, parrot lost in translation, and it's an overlay between two poems about uh, parrots. The first one is is. Skeleton. My name is Parrot, a bird of paradise. Um, and then the second one is a, a poem by Bai Jui called The Red Parrot. I'll, I'll, I'll read it in Chinese. An nan yuan jin hong ying wu, su su tao hua yu su ren, wen jiang ban jir jia ru zi, long jian he nian chu de shan. What's interesting about the poem, and this is why I say the parrot's lost in the translation, is that online you could generally only see the whaley, um, no, not the whaley, the, oh, now I've forgotten who has translated it, but um, maybe it was author whaley, yeah. But the translation you see online, um, mostly it doesn't quite, get the gist of the poem. It's, um, and that's why I say it's lost in translation. We, we know that it, it's translated as the parrot um, being a very talented individual. You know, he has a voice like a person and, and that's, that's quite like what it is. And he has feathers that are like peach blossoms. And, but in the English translation that we see, it says so, and, and because of that, they, some mysterious they, some authoritarian people put him in a cage and, and it was said to reflect um, the, the, the persecution of intellectuals. However, if you read about Bai Jui, he, he, he wrote in the vernacular, so um, that would be a little bit odd. And in fact, it says here, um, what year or when will the parrot ever leave his cage? So it's not as if he were put there, but um, maybe he's even um, stuck there on, with the, on, an, on his own volition. And um, so it's kind of an interesting uh, overlay between uh, 
interpretations. And my theory was that the English version maybe was um, influenced by uh, a reading of Skelton, just a theory. Okay, so I, I'm going to end here and uh, we'll go on to the next person. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I can't hear. Thank you, Janet. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll move on to uh, Lee Newman. Uh, Lee Newman draws anywhere he is. He has a sketchbook with him at all time. And he's teaching drawing fundamentals with us. And even the most gifted artists can always pick up tips from a master teacher like Lee. Um, I'm sure his students are having a rich experience. He can go on talking about paper, for example, and you can learn so much from Lee, just listening to him talk about the surface on which one can draw. I had the good fortune to have Lee as an art partner in Noma Gallery in Frederick, um, he's a very well known in the Frederick community. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Lee Newman. Thank you, Linda. Um, and yes, you're absolutely right. I, I do take a sketchbook. Um, most places I go, I have them all over the place in my car and so on. And what I thought I would show tonight are just that some sketches from one of those sketchbooks or really it's a clipboard. And Carol, if I could have the first one, please. Oh, maybe I'm. And the, the, to give a little background, I've got eight images to show. And um, uh, for several years, I've taught, I taught in the past um, uh, at a, a private girls high school, Catholic school in Bethesda, and every other week, the students would do community service, and they were assigned different places around the metropolitan area. And I would accompany, all the faculty would accompany them, and I was assigned to a school um, for uh, students young, from preschool to young adults who had severe cognitive and physical disabilities. And I found that a, a, a very, um, an, an environment that I had not experienced before and actually rather uncomfortable and difficult. And a way of, for me to address that is to, well, I uh, rolled up my sleeves and was helping the art teacher there and helping other teachers with, um, wheel, with the wheelchairs and moving students around but I found a little bit of time to draw on this. So I'm gonna show you a few sketches and these pertain to some of the things I'm teaching. This one is a, of a child who is, who is uh, painting. And uh, of course she was moving continually. So I just let the, I never erased. I just let the lines keep going as, and um, trying to dig in and investigate and um, the pose and her head on, on her shoulder. She was really intent on what she was doing. And so I, I was, she was a good model for me. Let's go to the next one, please. Here's one of the uh, teachers um, and one of the students. So many of them were, are, were in, are, are in um, wheelchairs and have, they, some of them have uh, trachs in them. And um, I found it, you know, I could see a lot of the different classes when I went to the uh, cafeteria. And here's a, a a teacher who is helping serve the student food. They they taught lessons, but they also they did everything for the students. And so, in in this drawing, it's on a toned piece of paper. And I started drawing with a white um, chalk, drawing the light. And then the so the next uh, this is to benefit my students. And the next lines I put in were the black lines on, on that tone ground. And so I, the, the light was the subject first and linked the two figures. And then I used the outline or the lines to 
um, draw, make them a unit together. And so the effort was here, not so much to draw, not draw portraits, but draw what they were doing together as an activity. Let's go on to the next one. Now, uh, this is in, in, often in, in out, drawing out in the world, there's, they're not good light conditions. They're not the sort of ideal conditions that one has in a drawing studio, for example. And this, this child, I, he was quite animated and um, fell asleep watching a video. And so I, as with the previous drawing, this started by drawing the light on him uh, as, uh, let's see if I can do the cursor, as it bounced back and forth through him and onto his bib and, and moved as a, as a melody through the space. And then I probably used a red chalk um, as, a, as a second voice. And then finally the bass notes or the dark chalk reinforced the forms as, and this shape here is meant to echo the shape of his ear. That's actually the, he's nestled into his wheelchair. Let's go to the next one. And this child was intent on listening to, I guess, one of the teachers. And so, you know, in these drawings, um, in these sketches, they're very fast. They're probably, you know, all the, all the marks made are what you see. There's no erasure, there's no time for anything. Every, uh, everything changes. And, uh, and I have to say why I would be drawing, I, there would, anything could happen. There could be an epileptic fit. There could be, you know, I, some child coming over to me and needing attention. So that I would have to catch the subjects as I could. And uh, what, what that does and being in, and I found it a very challenging environment to be in. And, I, um, and I'm sure the, the, student, the three students I would take there found that difficult too. Um, and I was, they were usually about 16 years old, these girls. Um, but they were intent on it, you know, being helpful and in, in, in administering community service. And what I was trying to do in the drawings was not just to pick the individuals, but understand, it's hard to understand in drawing something that you don't understand. And so that was, a, that was a goal of mine. Let's go to the next one. Ah, the, the, and, and sometimes as in this drawing, this, um, he, this child has, his hand was crooked almost permanently and he's, uh, they, they are all in, many of them are in wheelchairs with trays in front of them, and as he was. And I, I do remember distinctly starting this one with a salient feature of his ear because, again, it related to his arm. And I was telling my class today, we were drawing with line and doing uh, line, well, they were not line drawings, they're contour drawings. And there's a distinction between line and contour. Contour can line is is simply well as is defined in geometry but contour involves emphasis or phrasing in this case and and it can be an expression of a form sitting in space and so the weighted line i sometimes would start with a, um, a tentative line and then as the pose moved i would use a more um active you know heavier line and it, even when i'm when i was drawing some of the tone I was, I was lightly, touch was a very important thing. And one of the um, elements of drawing that's often overlooked is, um, the, of, is touch, the variety of touch. It's clearly important for a, a violinist to have a range of touch in the instrument. Well, that's true for, for a draftsman as well. And um, I, as a student, I was admonished to imagine that I was touching the the um, subject I was drawing. And if it's something that's uncomfortable to draw, it makes you a little apprehensive. But in this case, the touch goes beyond just recording the, the, the image. It, it has to, the caritas, it has to do with caring and charity and, and really um, trying to humanize the subject and understand them. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, that's, sorry, this is fuzzy. I'm a hor Phil, I'm a horrible photographer. So you're a great one. And I, I'm, I can't, I can't, couldn't scan this. This is the hand of one of my student, students, Sarah, feeding this child. And Sarah was quite, this was her first day at the, at the, um, 
at the Duckworth School. So I, I knew she was a little uncomfortable and I sort of wound up, followed her from her classroom, each was assigned to a different classroom and was there with her while she was feeding this child. And I, she did such a marvelous job of it. Um, and let's go to the next one. So that is a, a reversed image of it. I just, some of the drawings I have begun to make into uh, engravings. This is an engraved dry point engraving. And so it has, um, it's a fairly um, faithful transcription, if, but I made some changes. It, it, after, it goes from left to right. And so the culminating point is the child's head. And in this case, I, well, the, this, the series of arcs um, that have to do well with the feeding and the arc of the spoon going into the mouth, but caressing the head. That's the, the sort of a lyr subtle lyrical quality I wanted. As I, I, I love the, ch the child's, um, how, how her hair was, was fixed. The, the parents of these children uh, dress them very nicely. And, and I'm sure it's, a, a, I'm thinking about these kids, particularly at this time when they're, when they don't have access to care, when their uh, school is closed, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm the um, staff and the, and teachers at this school are were heroes of mine. I thought they were amazing for the care they were giving. I learned a lot there from them. Let's go to the next one. This is a um, just shift um, institutions. This was done in a Alzheimer's unit, closed ward of a of a. Uh, uh, care, you know, care, uh, adult care facility. And um, so I did the, this is a dry point. Um, I don't have the drawing. And the dry point means it's drawn directly into the, uh, in this case, plexiglass, and there's no possi possibility for revision. And I, I'm, I, I'm trying to understand Alzheimer's or aging in general. I find that a real challenge. And again, this, the balance of trying to depict the condition without um, sacrificing the humanity of the, uh, of the person I'm drawing. And in this case, I focused on her mouth. Um, and so I did this some time ago and let's go to the last slide. So last year, I guess, or year before last, yeah, then I pulled out the plate and I wanted to go further with it and it had been, I, there were things I liked about the linear structure of it, but I wanted to develop her more as, as, a, as a person, the way a novelist develops a character in, in a novel. And, and um, so I coaxed her out of the plate using, this is, um, this is a dry point. So I'm using printing ink and I would ink it up and using tools like sandpaper and a, and a, a tooth wheel called a roulette and a diamond point scribe to make marks in this plate until I, I felt I'd I'd uh, created more of a person persona and a, and a more volume in the head, and um, and I guess I I finished I I'd taken her to a new state, and that is the end. Thank you. Let's see. I'm going to thank you, me. Thank you. That was thank what you, a Linda. wonderful transition from well, the very detailed drawings of Janet Kozacek to sometime, the printmaking of yeah. Susan Mathen. That's, let's see. Now I need to, would you remind me again where I need to get out of this so that Susan can do her fine talk? I need to leave. Carol will, will show, show spotlight uh, Susan. Okay, great. There she is. Susan Mathis is a former student of mine from high school. Uh, she went to, was it Western Maryland when you were there or had it already become, it was Western Maryland. I what I was gonna read. And uh, has become a revered and respected art teacher in Frederick County. Uh, often worked with pastels, but her monoprinting technique, her watercolor monoprinting technique is very unique. So she's going to talk with you about that. Thank you, Susan. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Um, so um, Carol is setting up um, my slideshow, I think. And um, I'm going to go through some images. So a lot of these are um, old mono prints that I did um, quite a few years ago when I was working on my um, master's down at um, Maryland Institute. And I took a wonderful class with um, uh, Professor Sam Peters, and he was an amazing um, printmaker. And it was a mono print class, and I was like, okay, um, I'll get into some of the um, the techniques and one that I really fell in love with and have used over the years is the watercolor mono prints. And um, Carol, if you want to go ahead and put that on, it's gonna take or... me just a second. I didn't realize That's I was fine. sharing your screen. No problem. Or I you can do it if you need minutes. me to. You have about eight minutes, Susan. Not a problem. So as Linda said, um, I've been teaching in Frederick County for 37 years now, and um, I have pretty much all of the drawing and painting classes, the Art One classes. Um, I also have the AP Studio classes. So I have quite a, um, a conglomeration of different types of students. So I have students that you know are just coming in and um, learning basic drawing and painting skills. Um, sculpting skills and so forth. And then I have my um, AP students that um, I've shown them this technique and some of them have really fallen in love with um, the whole idea of creating a watercolor on plexiglass um, where you don't have to stretch paper, you don't have to worry about the paper warping and rolling and um, kind of going through um, that um, process. So um, I'm going to kind of go through and share um, the, some of the finished products. And um, some of these, as I said, are quite old. Um, I also did, when I was in Sam Peters' class, uh, I used not just watercolor. We used printing ink. We used um, oil paints um, for different you know, uh, effects. But I really fell in love with the whole idea of using watercolor. So these are um, uh, kind of a series. Uh, so they're more like a um, panoramic view um, of landscape. So I really got into the idea of, of dealing with the landscape. Um, and my students this week are hopefully going to produce um, a kind of a panorama like this. Um, so they are gonna be using their own you know, landscape images and so forth. Um, but what I did was I started off with an image that I um, illustrated um, just on sketch paper or sometimes I think um, some of these were even done on like a roll of paper towels. And you um, prepare plexiglass and you put the plexiglass over top of your, your drawing or you can just have it on white paper so you can see through it. And to prepare the plexiglass, um, you need to um, get it to the point that it will accept paint. Um, and to do that, if you just take a plain, plain piece of plexiglass, the paint's just going to roll off or beat up. So what you have to do is take a fine sandpaper, and um, I tell my students to kind of um, sand it in little circles, and it should look like it's frosted, and then just wipe off the dust um, off of the sanded surface. And you only need to do that on the side that you're going to paint. And then as you, you're about to see um, with some of these images, um, you're going to be able to pick up all kinds of details. So um, today what we did in class was we talked about techniques. We talked about color, color mixing, color theory. Um, tomorrow they're going to start dealing with the space and the landscape. Um, we also talked about um, some of the painting techniques like washes and wet into wet and um, dry brush and so forth, as you can see in um, my landscapes here. And these two landscapes um, I had on display last year um, at Uncommon Ground, and I just posted them um, on the school store, so they are um, for sale. Um, this top one is a piece uh, called Southwestern Skies, and that was done out in New Mexico and um, from photographs that I took when I was out there. And the lower two 
um, part one and part two are actually in Joshua Tree National Park. So um, those um, actually can, can connect and be a five piece um, uh, print. Carol, you can go to the next one. So there's a little bit of a detail, so you can see it a little bit better. These these were under glass, so they were a little bit hard to, to photograph without the glare and so forth, without taking them out of the frame. But you can see, um, you can pick up any kind of texture and detail um, with the watercolor. And I think that probably the biggest question is, well, why don't you just paint on the paper? Well, if you've ever used watercolor, it can be one of the most difficult painting mediums to work with because you can't cover up your mistakes. Um, a lot of times, if you work large, um, like I tend to do, um, you have to stretch paper and deal with, with, with warping and so forth. With this technique, you're painting on plexiglass. The only thing that you do have to really realize is that your image is going to be in reverse. So if you look at the one um, to my right, the tree was actually painted on the left side of the plexiglass. And when you flip the paper over um, to run it through, I used an etching press. Um, so very similar to Lee, as he was doing his dry point etchings, he, um, I'm sure he used a, an etching press. Um, it applies major pressure and the paper is actually dampened and um, blotted, so it's just very soft and saturated with water. And as you run it through the press, it pulls off most of the paint on your on your plexiglass. And all the brush strokes, um, you know, if you put salt in it or any other special technique, that is all picked up on um, from the plate onto the paper. Carol, you can go to the next one. And these are details also, and these are a little bit smaller. Um, the previous ones are about eight by 10 inches. Um, and I have all sizes of plexiglass. So, you know, when my students, you know, use it, they, um, they adjust to the size that they want to do. I usually start them off with a non-objective piece, um, like I was in my class today. And then we kind of move more toward the objective, but you can see, and yeah, no, the, the blending of watercolor and the very essence of the idea of watercolor is really, really captured really nicely. Um, and if there's an area that you don't like, like if I painted my bird here, I didn't like the way he appeared. Um, all I have to do is take a paper towel and wipe him off and repaint him. Um, you know, and if there's areas of my plate that um, were beating up and where the paint wasn't sticking, I just take a little sandpaper to it and um, then wipe it off and then paint over and it works really, really nicely. Carol, you can go to the next one. And there's that one. And the next one. And these were some old ones and I did put in some, um, using different materials. So all of these, I used an etching press. Um, this summer when um, uh, Linda initially asked me if I could do this online, I was like, oh, I don't know um, how it's going to work. Um, but I'm using a, um, a brayer. Um, a rolling pin seems to work okay, but I have a rubber brayer, which you can actually apply a little bit more pressure so you can really adhere that paint or pull the paint off of the plexiglass. And these were all done with an etching press. You can go to the next. And that was a really long one. These were all about, um, I guess, eight by 10 inches. Um, we had a really large um, press. Um, these are about eight by 10 inches. And you can see these look a little different. These are done with oil. So um, we did a similar technique. Um, and you can see uh, the difference between these and the watercolors because you can see the residue and the separation of the water and the oil. Um, and it creates some really, really neat um, abstract effects. Um, so I was still kind of tending toward um, landscapes, but they became much more abstract and um, almost non-objective. You can go to the next one. 
And then these are both watercolor, so you can definitely see the difference between the watercolor techniques and the colors um, present and um, the ones previous in oils. Okay. And then finally, I went back, um, those of you that have um, seen me before, I usually teach a um, pastel class as well. And this is what really started me was this machinery and the whole idea of motion and, and contrived motion and um, creating that. So I kind of went back to my, my subject matter that I had originally been working on and I kind of tucked in some, um, some monoprints. These two up here at the top um, right, the print to the far right is um, the original print um, or the first print. Sometimes if you have enough paint um, or ink on your plate, um, and you can do this with watercolor as well, um, you can get a second print and that would be the, the one in the middle at the top. And that is called a cognate print. So you can see how um, you can also do that as well. So um, with, with this technique, um, I have found that, um, Carol, you can go back. Um, I have found that it, it works great for teaching watercolor, for teaching techniques, um, even students that are um, very unfamiliar with, with paint and the way it works. It's very forgiving. Um, if they make a mistake, they can wipe their plate off or just a section of their plate and repaint it. Um, and they're not having to worry about paper warping and, and um, making a mistake and not being able to get rid of it um, and having to redo things. So it's been a, it's been a really um, kind of a, uh, a neat um, way to get across to my subject matter. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Sue. That was wonderful. We're running out of time because our presenters have shared a lot with us. Uh, we have two more artists. Uh, I believe we have to end exactly at 7.30. So uh, uh, Phil and Sue, would you uh, please do your presentation? You have about five minutes each. Thank you. Okay. I'm gonna let the the images do most of the talking. <laughs> uh, let's see. What do we do next? Um, hold on, folks. <laughs> oh, I had it. There we, there we go. Okay. I've been behind the camera for 54 years and I, and I photograph all kinds of subjects. Uh, I, I guess basically I consider myself a photojournalist, although I've been unemployed for the last three months from the Sun Papers. Um, anyway, uh, I love to shoot landscapes also. And lately I've been uh, using my telephone to, to make images. In fact, we're teach, I'm teaching a class in uh, cell phone photography. Anyway. This is a local farmer, Joe Schwartzbeck, when he was named Outstanding Farmer of Maryland. And Bill, can you the... share your screen? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we're... The green button at the bottom of the Zoom. I can't see it. If you hit the commands tab button, you should be able to go across. Yeah. 
if you hit command and tab, then you should be able to go between different screens and find the zoom icon, which is the blue with the um, camera on it. There, there we go. I don't see the share. It should there be it. a share screen at the bottom. Got it. Okay. All right. Are you seeing it now? Hello? How about letting, can you hear me? I don't hear anything. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, fine. Can you, did you find the Zoom program? And do you see the green share screen button? Oh, I thought I did. No, we're still seeing you, not the screen sharing. I don't know why. Why don't you go to, to uh, Sue Bloom? Okay. And we'll deal with this some other time. Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. If, if you would like me to slip to another light, Linda, I'm, well, I'm more than willing to do that. Um, uh, we could take you on Wednesday evening. Let's do that. If you would like to join us Wednesday evening, okay. I'll wrap us. I'll wrap us up for this evening. Um, tomorrow we are talking about with three-dimensional artist Joanne Bost, uh, Keith Taylor, and David Candler, or Kendall, uh, about three-dimensional art. So we will do beaded rocks. We will do. Uh, baskets and we will talk about origami. On Wednesday night, I believe Sue Bloom is going to join us. Uh, Catherine LaPietra and Gail Matthews are talking about wearable and fiber arts and Sue will be talking about her photography. Thursday evening, we're talking about public art with Michael Seip, a Baltimore screen painter, and Thomas Sterner, who's been granted several um, public sculpture offers in a variety of communities. Currently, he has some work in downtown Frederick. And of course, there's a beautiful piece in the center of downtown Westminster that Thomas has installed. On Friday night, we will kick off the concert with the awards ceremony for Janet Kozacek and Robin Tillery. So please join us each night at 6.30. And if your friends are not able to meet with us in real time, or many of our audience live outside the country and are coming to us in a different time zone. So you can go to the YouTube channel and feast your eyes on any of the selection of uh, recorded uh, and archived broadcasts. And those of you who missed any of the wonderful performances from week one can certainly catch up with those. Uh, the same for week three. They're open and available to the public so your friends and family can join you, whether they're in your living room or not. Thank you very much for coming to our first two-dimensional gallery talks, and I'll see you tomorrow night, same time. Bye-bye.